for you. Um, and it's going to be a wonderful uh, morning of worship. It actually feels like winter outside. So maybe, I heard that we're going to get some snow maybe later on this week. So I don't know. That makes my little Virginia heart happy. So I don't know. Um, but without further ado, friends, let's take um, some time uh, to go to the Lord in prayer to open up the worship. Let's pray. Almighty God, whose Son, our Savior, Jesus Christ, is the light of the world, grant that your people, illumined by your word and sacraments, may shine with the radiance of Christ's glory, that he may be known, worshipped, and obeyed to the ends of the earth. We pray this through Jesus Christ, our Lord, who with you and the Holy Spirit lives and reigns one God, now and forever. Amen. Would you please stand and sing with us this morning? Worthy of every song we could ever sing Worthy of all the praise we could ever bring. Worthy of every breath we could ever breathe. We live for you. Jesus, the name above every other name. Jesus, the only one who could ever say, worthy of every breath we could ever breathe, we live for you. Holy, there is no one like you, there is none beside you. Open up my eyes in wonder and show me who you are and fill me with your heart and lead me in your love to those around me. Worthy of every song we could ever sing And worthy of all the praise we could ever bring Worthy of every breath we could ever breathe We live for you And holy there is no one like you there is none beside you open up my eyes in wonder and show me who you are and fill me with your heart and lead me in your love to those around me And I will build my life upon your love. It is a firm foundation. And I will put my trust in you alone. And I will not be shaken. And I will build my life upon your love it is a firm foundation and i will put my trust in you alone and i will not be shaken holy there is no one like you there is none beside 
inside you open up my eyes in wonder and show me who you are and fill me with your heart and lead me in your love to those around me thousand generations are falling down in worship to sing the song of ages to the Lamb. And all who've gone before us and all who will believe to sing the song of ages to the Lamb. Your name is the highest, your name is the greatest, your name, it stands above them all. All thrones and dominions, all powers and positions, your name, it stands above them all. And the angels cry, Holy of the ancient Christ, Holy, you are lifted high, Holy, Holy forever. So if you've been forgiven if you've been redeemed and sing the song forever to the land if you walk in freedom if you bear his name and sing the song forever to the land Sing a song forever and amen. Your name is the highest. Your name is the greatest. Your name, it stands above them all. All thrones and dominions, all powers and positions, your name. It stands above them all, and the angels cry, Holy, all creation cries, Holy, you are lifted high, Holy, Holy for people sing holy to the king of kings holy you will always be holy holy forever you will always be scripture for this morning comes from Psalm 72, the first uh, few verses, and then we're going to skip down um, to verses 10 through 14. So hear the word. 
Give the king your justice, O God, and your righteousness to the royal son. May he, may he judge your people with righteousness and your poor with justice. Let the mountains bear prosperity for the people and the hills in righteousness. May he defend the cause of the poor of the people. Give deliverance to the children of the needy and crush the oppressor. May they fear you while the sun and yours and as long as the moon throughout the, all generations. May he be like rain that falls on the mown grass, like showers that water the earth. In his days, may the righteous flourish and peace abound till the moon be no more. May the kings of Tarshish and of the coastlands render him tribute. May the kings of Sheba and Saba bring gifts. May all kings fall down before him, all nations serve him. For he delivers the needy when he calls, the poor and him who has no helper. He has pity on the weak and the needy and saves the lives of the needy. From the oppression and violence, he redeems their life, and precious is their blood in his sight. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Friends, let's uh, respond to hearing our first scripture of the morning with our traditional Apostles' Creed, which is found in your bulletins and on the screens. So, friends, what do you believe? I believe in God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth. And in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and buried. The third day he rose from the dead, he ascended into heaven, and sitteth at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From thence he shall come to judge the quick and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and life everlasting. Amen. Friends, this morning, do we have any uh, new uh, prayer requests this week, or do we have any updates on prayer requests or even some praises this morning? Pretty quiet. So everyone's starting off the new year well. That's good. All right, friends, if there is uh, nothing, um, let's go to the Lord in prayer. Almighty God, we thank you so much for this day. We thank you for this opportunity that we've been able to come and to worship alongside our brothers and our sisters and worship you, to give you all the glory and praise that is due you. Lord, this morning, there may be things on our hearts and minds that we don't feel that we can put into words that we may not feel that we could bring um, in front of other people. But you know what's on our hearts. You know what's on our minds. And you know what we need, Lord. Lord, cast out any anxieties, any burdens that we might have this morning and help us to lay them at your feet and trust in you and your presence. God, we give you thanks for all that we have, all of your provision. We thank you for health and any recovery. We thank you for simply being who you are. And we pray all this in the name of your son who taught us to pray, praying, our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread. And forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Amen. Now, would you please stand as we sing again today? Something gains be lifted up and tell everyone how great the love, the love come down from heaven's gate.
sing. Who is this King of glory, the Lord strong and mighty? Who is this King of glory, the Lord strong and mighty? Lift up your hands, be lifted up, and let the redeemed declare the love. We bow down at heaven's gate to the feet of love and grace. Who is this King of glory? The Lord strong and mighty, who is this King of glory? The Lord strong and mighty. There is one God, He is Lord. Of glory, strong and mighty. There is one God, He is holy. There is one Lord over everything. There is one King, He is Jesus. King of glory, strong and mighty. Who is this King of glory, the Lord strong and mighty? Who is this King of glory, the Lord strong and Search the world, but it couldn't fill me. And man's empty praise, and treasures that fade would never enough. And you came along and put me back together. Every desire is now satisfied here in your love. Oh, there's nothing better than you. There's nothing better than you. There's nothing. Nothing is better than you. I'm not afraid to show you my weakness, my failures and flaws. Lord, you've seen them all, and you still call me friends. Because the God of the mountain is the God of the valley. And there's not a place your mercy and grace won't find me again. Oh, there's nothing better than you. There's nothing better than you. There's 
nothing, nothing is better than you. You turn morning to dancing. You give beauty for ashes. You turn shame into glory. You're the only one who can. You turn graves into gardens. You turn bones into armies. You turn seas into highways. You're the only one who can. Oh, there's nothing better than you. There's nothing better than you. There's nothing. Nothing is better than you. You may be seated. Well, friends, um, we, it is wonderful to be up here again with y'all. Um, last week uh, began the Epiphany season. Last Saturday, January 6th, was Epiphany uh, Day itself. And then we moved into uh, celebrating Epiphany, which is this wonderful season of remembering the revelation or manifestation of Jesus to the world, particularly the Gentiles. And so last week, uh, Pastor Taylor and I, uh, when we still had our Christmas decorations up, we finally took them down yesterday, uh, we moved our wise men from across the living room and they traveled across the TV and other places to finally meet baby Jesus. It's a tradition that we do. Uh, we don't put the wise men in the nativity scene, but we wait until Epiphany to move them uh, to meet baby Jesus. And so uh, Pastor Taylor uh, introduced you to our new sermon series for this time. Um, last week, we're calling it The Big Reveal. And so the big reveal is that Jesus is best known by what he does. In other words, we know Jesus for who he is because of what he has done and what he is doing even now in the present. And so that's how we're going to look at who Jesus is over the next few weeks leading right up into Lent. And so it's going to be a really great time. And so I hope y'all stick with us. I hope y'all continue um, to read the, the scriptures that we read from and really continue to ponder them about how we know Jesus because of what he's done. And so our scripture for this morning is from the Gospel of Matthew. It's going to be Matthew chapter 2, 1 through 12. And so I always encourage you to have your Bibles in hand or even open up that Bible app, um, even as it's in your bulletins and on the screens. And uh, for respect of the gospel account, will you please stand for the reading of the gospel? Matthew chapter 2. Now, after Jesus was born in Bethlehem of Judea, in the days of Herod the king, behold, wise men from the east came to Jerusalem, saying, Where is he who has been born king of the Jews? For we saw his star when it rose and have come to worship him. When Herod the king heard this, he was troubled, and all Jerusalem with him. And assembling all the chief priests and scribes of the people, he inquired of them where the Christ was to be born. They told him in Bethlehem of Judea, for so it is written by the prophet, and you, O Bethlehem, in the land of Judah, are by no means least among the rulers of Judah. 
For from you shall come a ruler who will shepherd my people, Israel. Then Herod summoned the wise men secretly and ascertained from them what time the star had appeared. And he sent them to Bethlehem, saying, Go and search diligently for the child. And when you have found him, bring me word that I too may come and worship him. After listening to the king, they went on their way. And behold, the star that they had seen when it rose went before them until it came to rest over the place where the child was. When they saw the star, they rejoiced exceedingly with great joy. And going into the house, they saw the child with Mary, his mother, and they fell down and worshiped him. Then opening their treasures, they offered him gifts, gold and frankincense and myrrh. And being warned in a dream not to return to Herod, they departed to their own country by another way. This is the word of God for us, the people of God. Thanks be to God. You may be seated. You know, over the ages, we as humanity have considered the heavens, right? We have the stars, we have the planets, we have the galaxies, and then in between that, it seems that there's just a lot of space and emptiness. We look to the heavens for beauty, right? We look to them for inspiration. We look at even the patterns that space has. When I was younger, I remember uh, if the sky was clear and we were in the right position in Fredericksburg, Virginia, then my dad would set up a telescope. He had this little telescope and he would move it to where he wanted it and he would let us peer through that lens. And we would all take turns, my siblings and I, and maybe, just maybe, we could see the rings of Saturn if it was close enough. And sometimes we would see Venus shining very brightly, or we could see Jupiter. I don't know a lot about the sky. I don't know a lot about stars and their constellations. I can barely tell you where the Big Dipper is, okay? That's, that's how bad I am. I can't tell you a lot about the planets that we see, except I think that Pluto should still be a planet. I don't know a lot about the sky, but I can tell you that it's beautiful. When you look up at a clear night sky, if you get away from all the light pollution that we have, it's amazing. I I love looking at the night sky these little lights that God has put into place, and I find myself in awe of just how vast the universe is. And because as a Christian, I think of how creative our creator is. Since the most ancient times of civilization, the stars and the planets have been looked to, and some people still consider them to be signs of knowledge and power. Some might have thought that the stars and planets themselves were divine beings. They're considered to hold the key to the universe, all the answers to life, all the answers to significant events, even maybe causing earthly events to happen. And people still can think this astrology or, you know, the the study of the stars and and horoscope are as popular as ever. They're as popular as ever because of new age spirituality and new age spirituality really isn't new. It's ancient. Individuals want to know how their day is going to go or their life or how they're supposed to act based on the positions of stars and planets. They want to know if their birthday has any significance. They can explain away events that happen if planets are aligned or not, or if they're in certain phases. And I want to say just as a note, Christians aren't supposed to do that, by the way. We're not supposed to look at the signs of uh, stars as being divine. Um, We don't look at horoscopes, even just for fun. 
And yet so many people do, even as a joke. Long-held beliefs that the heavens corresponded with earthly events persist. We think that we can learn the mysteries of the stars and the planets, and then so we can track down power and designate significance for humanity. But the thing about the stars and the planets and the heavens and the galaxies is that they're just creation. They're beautiful and they're mysterious, but they're created, right? They are created by God. They are not God. They aren't all-knowing, all-powerful beings. They don't love us, and they don't tell us who we are. God does. God, revealed in Jesus, is where we get our identity from. And so in our passage of scripture this morning, it can feel maybe strange to look at such a story as the Magi, translated wise men, coming after the birth narrative of Jesus who are guided by a star. It can feel interesting, wondering why this was put here. But Matthew's gospel account is a very Jewish-oriented gospel. That was the original audience. You can catch all the the Jewish uh, touches in his gospel account. And so to have a picture painted of magic-practicing, stargazing Gentiles would have been puzzling and odd and strange for the original audience to hear. This would have made their ears prick up and be like, eh, wait a minute. (laughs) what's going on because while not affirming magic or astrology we see the magi these magicians arrive to see jesus the child because they followed a star created by god matthew is quite clear from the beginning of his narrative by listing jesus's genealogy that holds all types of people to the very end of his gospel that this is a dynamic account of God's self-revelation, God's self-revelation to the world. So friends, I want to be very clear, it's not about the star. We've made it about the star, but it's not about the star. It's about the creator being discovered by his creation to be loved and worshiped. Jesus is revealed to be the true light of the world, even as a child. And so when our magi arrive on the scene, it's not the storybook, fairy tale legends that we've made it out to be. There's actually like a hint of danger because of Herod. And so these men are not just coming randomly, but they are longing to find the source of this cosmic event. They're not looking at the star as a source, but they're, they're trying to find the source of, of that star. And there's a different thinking and a different orientation to that. And so our magi weren't at the birth of Jesus. He's already born. And so that's significant because even though we've pushed the Matthew and Luke together and conflated them and made them one story for our Christmas cards, the Magi weren't there. They were traveling. They were traveling from the east, and anything east of Jerusalem was called the east, okay? And so it would have been a long journey from wherever they were coming from, and it would have taken months maybe a year or two, depending on how far away they were. So when we see the child, that's deliberate. Jesus is not necessarily a newborn infant anymore. They've arrived to see the child in the house. The journey from the eastern part of the known world to Judea would have been long. It would have been taxing and tiring. But before they get to meeting Jesus, 
the wise men do something that maybe a lot of men don't do, and they stop and ask for directions. They stop in Jerusalem, and they want to know, well, where is this child who's been born, king of the Jews? We need some next steps. We need some help. And again, there's going to be some danger there. And we think that there's only three of them because of the gifts, gold, frankincense, and myrrh. We, so we say, oh, well, there were three of them, one for each gift. Well, actually, traveling that long of a distance, there's probably a whole entourage. And so their coming into Jerusalem would not have been missed. Here are some foreigners, they're not even Jews, and they're coming into Jerusalem probably with a whole gaggle of people wearing funny clothes, bearing gifts. They would not have been missed. And we also don't know their names. Again, we like to put little tidbits that we would say is fact or tradition. We've called, given them names so that we can personalize them, but we don't know who they are. All we know is that they're from the east and they came to worship Jesus. We call these magicians kings in our songs, you know, we three kings, but they're not kings. Because if we called them kings instead of simply wise men or magicians or magi, then what we do is do a disservice to the actual kings in this story. And there are only two kings in this narrative. There is Herod the Great, who is the puppet king placed by the Roman Empire. And then there is Jesus, the king of kings. These magi were simply educated. They were sorcerers who looked to the heavens for answers. And so this star that seems to have come from God himself points to a place which is very interesting for them. It points to the place where heaven meets earth. And that heaven meets earth in baby Jesus. And so this star and their understanding meant a significant earthly event. Stars in ancient times often signified the birth of a king. But it's not creation that's the point. It's the God of the universe, the creator, revealing himself to his beloved humanity as a human, displaying his glory, and he displays his glory to all kinds of people. So despite the perhaps odd way of arriving to follow the sign that God placed, that very understanding and source of the sign for the Magi was used to bring them to God himself. So using an otherwise insignificant light of night to bring these pagans, these outsiders, to the knowledge of the true light of the world. There's a reorientation happening in world view. And so this is the power of Jesus being revealed, that God was already working to make the Messiah known to all nations, bringing Gentiles into the invitation to know him, to know their creator. Even as a child, Jesus is already beginning to fulfill the promise of bringing all nations to himself. And so the Magi found out the truth that they were searching for, that there was a child king, born, not made, worthy of worship, even as he had no power in the political or religious realms. He was simply sitting on his young mother's knee, and yet he was worthy to be worshipped. Like the passage in Isaiah 60 says, Arise, shine, your light has come. Your light has come. It's a beautiful image, friends, and it adds to the significance of light. Light 
like a star. The Jewish scriptures spoke of a star rising out of Jacob, which is Israel. And so that's why the star became a symbol of the long-awaited Messiah. They were waiting for this promise of God. Which is why it's so profound then that as this bright, shining star placed by God is moving, and stars don't really move, and so the star is moving, and it comes over to rest over Bethlehem, it's interesting that it was missed. It was missed by the very ones who were supposed to be looking for it. Take a moment to consider that both ancient Jewish and ancient Eastern cultures had an understanding of light, and yet the non-Jews in our story recognized this invitation to come and worship the king of the Jews, while the priests and the scribes, the, the religious minds who knew their scriptures, sat in the temple and palace close to political power, trying to appease a king. The significance of this episode, church, is that in the end, it's not the star or even the magi themselves that is the point. But as God revealed himself to bring all the nations to respond to his coming in the flesh, a promise has been fulfilled. And it was two very interesting people. The king of the Jews, revealed and adored by non-Jews. This is a dangerous picture. It's dangerous because barriers are already being broken down by Jesus. While pagans call Jesus king of the Jews, while Herod, the current king over the Jews, sits. This is a threatening picture, not a storybook picture. Because if Jesus, the child, is the true king, then that makes Herod ultimately a false king. And if we take it a step further, if Jesus, the child, is the true king, then ultimately Caesar, the emperor, doesn't have all the power in the world. And he's not the divine being like they think emperors were. This narrative is dangerous because the wrong people worshipped the Lord and Savior. God invited the wrong guests to the party. So there's a story of a missionary in China. And all he did was garden. He was a good gardener, and so he wanted to garden in China. And so... He taught people to raise different vegetables. He taught them how to feed their children better. He even taught them how to raise livestock. And so all the while, he's gardening and he's helping people. All the while, he told stories of Jesus. He even took the time to translate a few of them into the Chinese language. He made his home there. He was so at home that when he found two little girls left in trash cans, he adopted them as his own daughters. This missionary was at home, but then one day, this missionary gardener was arrested. He was arrested by the authorities in China. And when the authorities were asked, why did you arrest him? He, that all they said was, well, he's dangerous. And everyone was confused because this guy, he gardens. He's never lifted a finger in violence. He just takes care of the ground and plants. How is this man dangerous? Turns out to the Chinese authorities, he was so dangerous because this missionary loved well. And he loved all the wrong kinds of people taking in unwanted children. And he loved 
everybody, not just a select few, but anyone who came across his path. And it was dangerous because he told the gospel of Jesus Christ. It made him dangerous to the established powers. The Magi unknowingly put themselves against the religious and political powers of the day simply because they came in search of the king of the Jews, which they discovered to be worthy of worship. They were unknowingly put against the powers of the day because the love of God, the love of God met people right where they were. But you can bet that they were left changed. Jesus himself would be put against the religious and political powers as Herod the Great's son, Herod Antipas, would end up playing a large part in Jesus' adult life. Because Jesus, proclaiming the kingdom of God, would threaten the Herod household and their rule. God revealed his love through the childlike faith of Jesus. And there were those who opposed that light, and there are still those who oppose that light. There are those who tried to snuff it out as they heard the possibility that the king of the world has come, and yet it couldn't be snuffed out. That light continues to shine on then and now. God has come. And he's revealed himself in Jesus so that all nations, all peoples could be invited into his story of salvation and renewal of his beloved creation. Jesus as a child was worthy of worship from those who otherwise would not have ever been associated with. Our story this morning is not the Christmas card story. There is darkness that tries to overshadow the light, but thanks be to God, the light is not overtaken by darkness. The Magi are a humbling image of truly seeing the creator among the creation. They worship bringing gifts of gold and frankincense and myrrh. And these gifts signify his divine royalty, his anointed priesthood, and they even foreshadow the burial spices and oils that would be used once he dies a criminal's death. This king of the Jews our Magi demonstrate, will rule over all people and all nations. His reign, however, will be one of peace and one of God's justice and righteousness. It'll be one of renewal. The Magi point us forward. They point us forward into what is to come with the kingdom of God. All people will come. All will bow down, and there is room. Matthew's gospel account bookends with the nations. I encourage you to go and, and look later on, beginning and end. We begin with the nations through the Magi coming to worship Jesus, and then we end, Matthew, with the resurrected Jesus commissioning the disciples to go and Make disciples of all nations. We're pointed forward. The only other time Jesus is called king of the Jews, other than here, is when Pilate and his soldiers call him king of the Jews as he's being crucified. The only other time Jesus is called the king of the Jews, a crown not of gold but of thorns will be placed on his head. He'll be not on a majestic throne but a throne of a wooden cross. 
And yet, even in that moment, the love of God will be revealed in the suffering face of Jesus. No other thing can reveal the love of God for all people like the face of Jesus. No star, no planet, no political force, no institution. Jesus is God's love. Jesus is God's salvation meeting us right where we are, inviting us to take long and hard journeys to set aside our own pagan ways and come be renewed, to come and worship the creator and Lord, the savior and king, the one who brings us peace and comfort and calls us out of the darkness of our sin and into being new creations. We're invited, we're we're beckoned to follow him. We should fall on our faces and worship him. We should love him and leave behind everything else. So Jesus has revealed the love of God in his face. Are we going to see his face? Are we going to see his love and be drawn in? And will we love him back? That is the question. Amen. Let's pray. Precious Lord, we thank you for loving us more than we could ever comprehend. We praise you for being our creator, our redeemer, our savior, our king. Lord, soften our hearts to see your great love for all people. Lord, let us live in your light and let us shine forth that light so that others may know the love of you. Give us the grace to worship and obey you for the love of you all the days of our lives. We pray this in the holy name of your dear son, our Lord Jesus. Amen. Friends, it's always a good and right thing to respond to the gospel that Jesus reveals the love of God to creation and we're invited in by partaking in holy communion where Jesus himself is the host. And so as we prepare our hearts for receiving of the sacrament, I encourage you to find the communion liturgy booklet uh, in front of you or there might be some extras Um, up here in the front. You will be the people in bold for your responses. Friends, Christ our Lord invites to his table all who love him, who earnestly repent of their sin and seek to live in peace with one another. Therefore, let us confess our sin before God and one another, praying, Almighty and most merciful God, We confess and lament that we have sinned against you in thought, word, and deed. We have not loved you with our whole heart. We have failed to be an obedient church. We have not loved our neighbor as ourselves. We are truly sorry and we humbly repent. Because the remembrance of our sin is more than we can bear, have mercy on us and forgive us. For the sake of your Son, Jesus Christ, pardon us of all that is past and grant that we may ever see you in newness of life to the glory of your holy name. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. Take some time now for silent confession. In his great mercy, our almighty God and heavenly father has promised forgiveness of sin to all who repent and with true faith turn to him. May he have mercy upon you, pardon and deliver you from all your sins and conform and confirm and strengthen you in all goodness and bring you to everlasting life through Jesus Christ, our Lord. 
And so, friends, here are these comforting words that Jesus, our Savior, says to all who truly turn to him, that God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whoever believes in him should not perish but have eternal life. And so, friends, let us take time to turn our hearts towards the Lord. The Lord be with you. Lift up your hearts. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is right. It is right. In our joy to give thanks to you in all places and at all times, Almighty Father. You are the source of all truth, life, and love. You made us in your image and breathed into us the breath of life. When in our sinfulness we turned away from you and our love failed, your love remained steadfast. You delivered us from captivity, made covenants to be our sovereign God, and called us to new life in Jesus Christ our Lord. Therefore, we praise you with the angels and archangels and all the company of heaven, forever singing this hymn to the glory of your name. Holy, holy, holy Lord, God of power and might, heaven and earth are full of your glory. Hosanna in the highest. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna in the highest. All praise and glory is yours, O God our Father. For in your tender mercy you gave your only Son, Jesus Christ, to the world. In Jesus you revealed yourself, our light and our salvation. Your Spirit anointed him to bring good news to the poor, to bind up the brokenhearted, to comfort those who mourn, to proclaim freedom to the captives, to set at liberty those who are oppressed, and to announce the year of the Lord's favor. In obedience to your will, he stretched out his arms upon the cross and offered himself once for all, that by his suffering and death we may be saved. By his resurrection, he broke the bonds of death. He trampled hell and Satan under his feet. As our great high priest, he ascended to your right hand in glory, that we might come with confidence before the throne of grace. And so on that last night when he was betrayed, Jesus took bread and he gave thanks and he gave it to his disciples and said, take, eat. This is my body, which is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. And when the supper was over, he took the cup, gave thanks to you, God, gave it to his disciples and said, drink from this, all of you. This is my blood of the new covenant poured out for you and for many for the forgiveness of sins. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. So we proclaim the mystery of faith saying, Christ has died, Christ has risen, Christ will come again. We celebrate this memorial of our redemption, O Father, receiving these gifts of bread and juice with thanksgiving for the death and resurrection of your son, Jesus Christ. Lord, sanctify them by your word and Holy Spirit to be for us the body and blood of Christ. Sanctify us also that we may worthily receive this holy sacrament and partake of his most blessed body and blood. By your spirit, make us one with Christ and one as your church, that Christ may dwell in us and we in him. In the fullness of time, Put all things in subjection under your Christ and gather us together with all your saints in the joy of your heavenly kingdom where we will see our Lord face to face. We ask this through your Son, to whom with you and the Holy Spirit and your holy church be all honor and glory now and forever. Amen. Christ, our Passover lamb, has been sacrificed once for all upon the cross. Therefore, let us keep the feast. Alleluia. Let us pray. We do not presume to come to this, your table, O merciful Lord, trusting in our own righteousness, but in your abundant and great mercies. We are not worthy so much as to gather up the crumbs under your table. But you are the same Lord whose character is always to have mercy. 
Grant us, therefore, gracious Lord, so to eat the flesh of your dear Son, Jesus Christ, and to drink his blood, that our sinful bodies may be made clean by his body, and our souls washed through his most precious blood, and that we may evermore dwell in him and he in us. Amen. Lamb of God, you take away the sin of the world. Lamb of God, you take away the sin of the world. Lamb of God, you take away the sin of the world. Brothers and sisters, these are the gifts of God for the people of God. When you receive them, receive them in remembrance that Christ died for you and feed on him in your hearts by faith with thanksgiving. This morning, we will, of course, uh, receive by intinction. You will come up. You will have your hands cupped. You'll receive a piece of bread, dip it into the cup, and take both of them together, and then you may return to your seat. This morning, if Mike would help serve uh, communion, and we will serve one another and Hayden, and then we will serve the congregation. Friends, will you pray with me? Heavenly Father, we thank you for the gift of the sacrament, this sign of your assurance and grace. When we leave this place, send us out to do the work that you've given us to do, to love and serve you as faithful witnesses of Christ our Lord. Amen. Would you please stand as we close with a final song today? There's nothing better than you. There's nothing better than you. There's nothing. Nothing is better than you. Oh, there's nothing better than you. There's nothing better than you there's nothing nothing is better than you friends jesus 
has been revealed. And he's been revealed to all kinds of people. His face shines forth the love of God, beckoning us in. Take that revelation, take that love, live it and share it with those around you. Go in peace.